I'm pleased to introduce and for the last <coughs> talk of today in this room, uh, Edith Mandel. She's a principal at Greenwich Street Advisors. She's here today to talk about quantitative trading in the euro dollar futures market. And I was just telling her, it's really exciting for me to have this talk here today because one of the things that I have started working on at Quantopian is adding future support. And it is brand new to me and to a lot of the team at Quantopian that's more equities focused. So it's exciting to see futures interest here in the community because it is something we're looking <coughs> to grow. And uh, if you are interested in playing around with futures on Quantopian in the future, let me know because I can help you out. And you'll so, let me know. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so take okay. it away. Thank okay. you. Okay. So let's get started. Can I close the door? Yeah, it should show on its own. So, I guess I'm supposed to be stuck here. Sorry, I'm short. I'm going to be hiding behind the podium because of the mic, so you may not be able to see me. Talks like this are not easy to give because, like, if you've been trading in this market for you know a decade plus, like, you may not learn anything new. Although I, you know, I doubt it, but. And if you don't know anything at all, like if you've never heard about your dollar future, so what the library rate is, like they may, it may just be over your head. Like, so it's, it's very difficult to calibrate it, but you know, like we'll give it a shot. So I'm gonna try to drive really two points home. And, and if, you know, if you leave like, without really getting it, like that means that you know, I failed. Like one point is that the market is really complicated and there is a lot of quantitative work to do and the quantitative work pays off. Like that's point number one. And I'll give you a flavor of that. The, uh, and the other is that it's in euro dollar futures and on fixed income in general, like it's very difficult to separate liquidity provision from trading alpha, from execution, like the lines are very blurry. And, it's, and if you set up your business in a way that you have this like very strong, like very like, you know, well-defined lines between liquidity provision and like you know, I'm the alpha trader and I'm the market maker and I'm the execution broker, then it's very difficult to make this business successful. And that's, to some extent, it's true in, in any asset class. You know, if I have clients and if I have positions, it's much easier for me to offer liquidity and execute for clients. Like it gives me an edge, you know, it gives me this extra edge to, that, that I can lean against. But in fixed income and in euro dollars in particular, like it's it just you know it's 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 really really important to be able to like do essentially everything. That and you'll see why. So. So here is how, what we're gonna do like in the like 40 minutes or so that we have. Like, so I'm gonna give you, you know, like we'll talk about definitions a little bit and what the contracts are. And uh, then we'll talk about the pro rata matching in this market, which is like, one of the, the most important features of the euro dollar futures market and what the implications are. And then we'll talk about uh, hidden liquidity, like the implied and hidden liquidity and you know, how do we find this hidden liquidity. And then we'll talk about dynamics and the yield curve effects and uh, and how it affects everything that we do in the euro dollar futures market. So those are the, uh, that, that's the plan. <coughs> the, just a bit of a more like a perspective, like the bird's eye view, like when many of you think about fixed income, you think about like this is just a voice market, like a trace over the telephone, like there isn't really anything for all the traders to do. And it used to be the case, like it's uh, really no longer the case, like the market is in transition. And there are really these like three parts of the market, the uh, like, you know, like the bigger picture, the, uh, you know, there is like vast part of the market that's still very much voice and most of it will remain voice. There are markets that are in transition that the, the so-called RFQ markets, like request for quote type markets, those are markets in transition. And then there are this, uh, you know, like the pockets of highly liquid uh, products like the, like the euro dollar futures, which are order driven markets. And the, it's, it's, it's kind of surprising that, uh, you know, euro dollar market is really, not very well known. Like if you talk to a lot of investors, like never heard about it. Like even though the market is enormous, like it's about two million contracts trade daily, and many investors don't know about it. Like even though, let's say for comparison, like the oil futures are very well known, but only about half a million oil, you know, oil futures trade, and like for gold futures, it's I think it's something like hundred thousand. The so w what are the reasons? Like one reason is uh, fixed income in general is very heavily institutional market. It's a market of insiders, like, so to speak, and it's like there is very, very little retail presence, and uh, for a number of reasons, like we don't have to get into them. But the 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 euro dollar market is it actually has a flavor of retail in a way, like for because like if you think about like, who are the participants in the euro dollar market, the uh, it's macro traders, you know, like traders who take views on 
you know, what rates are gonna do like, over the next, whatever, you know, six months, 12 months. Like they, <coughs> they take the views on monetary policy. Those are macro traders. And then there are option hedgers, like the Euro dollar options market is a huge market and all of the hedging is uh, happening electronically. Like the Euro dollar is fully electronic market, like it trades on Globex. Pit actually closed last year, like it was like a very important event that there isn't, you know, Pit doesn't exist as far as I know. The, so it, it has this flavor of a retail because the macro traders and the option hedgers, like they're not really short term alpha traders. You know, like their views are much longer term. They don't really care about, you know, they don't have this sort of like price point sensitivity like on a, you know, minute by minute or hour to hour basis. Like their horizons are much longer. That's why like there is this retail flavor. The, so just speaking of definitions, so what is a, you know, what is a euro dollar future? So for instance, U7 at $99, like it's, it's a future, it's a cash settle future contract on the future level of LIBOR. So you know, it, it implies LIBOR at 1% as of September 2017. The universe of contracts is very large. Like there are, you know, like there are 10 years of quarterly contracts that are four monthlies. There are lots of combinations trades, like roughly a thousand, like that number varies day to day. So what are the combinations? Like the you know, spreads, you know, like the, you know, you, the calendar <laughs> spreads, like, the, like this example here, like H0, U0. And uh, there are butterflies, like there'll be, you know, like long, one contract and like the uh, short, the, the short belly and long the, the other leg, right? That's the example of a butterfly. So it's one minus two one. Packs and bundles, and that's maybe it's easier to see it in the picture. So those are the on the right. Those are the uh, the average volumes, like daily volumes. So the, the red pack, and they are labeled as colors. Like the the red pack is the first, you know, it's the, it's the first first year. It's the one year pack and then the second pack, the greens, the, the blues and, and so on. The liquidity has been growing, like it's interesting that uh, when I was looking at this uh, like roughly in 2011, 2012, it was virtually impossible to trade golds, like the golds, it's the, it's the, it's the four year. Like there was very little liquidity that you can source in golds, but when uh, like there may be like, you know, 5,000 trading daily, but when the rates are very low, when the rates are, you know, like the short rates are on hold, then the only volatility that you can ever pick up is really like in the, in the belly of the curve or in the back end of the curve, and the front end is completely packed, like there is just nothing going on there. So the liquidity has been growing, you know, as we stayed in this low rate environment. And now like there is a lot of liquidity in gold and in purples and, uh, and even in, uh, in, 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 in pink and in the orange, something that just did not exist even a few years ago. So those are a couple of pictures just to give you a sense, uh, you know, so this is the euro dollar rates curve. So euro dollar rate is 100 minus the price. So that's the definition of it. The, uh, and this is a daily, this is a profile of a daily change in, uh, in basis points. The, uh, I cheated a little bit, like you see like that's such a pretty picture, like it looks so nice. And uh, the, it's, uh, those snapshots were taken on the day of a payroll and the, the payroll was a, was a positive surprise, and, uh, and there was a you know it was a big sell off. Like so, when uh, the uh, you know when you expect that the economy is growing and things are you know things are you know things are going well, then you would expect that the Fed would rate uh, will, will, will hike rates a little bit sooner. So you end up with a sell off, and that's uh, so. This is roughly like a year, year and a half out, and this is the most volatile part of the euro dollar curve. Like this is when like and, and again like if you think about it, it makes sense that when numbers come out, like, you know, it's very difficult for investors to change their opinions of what's gonna happen five years from now, like who knows what's gonna happen five years from now. And then translates into a very low level of volatility, like far out. But investors change their opinions of what's gonna happen a year from now, or 18 months from now, like very, very frequently in response to data, so you end up with this volatility hump. Like that's what like market participants talk about all the time, like this volatility hump, it's a very persistent effect. The, uh, and it looks so nice, uh, typically, you know, and you can think about, you think in terms of factors, it would really take a very few factors to explain this sort of move. Like you clearly don't see 20 degrees of freedom, like, you know, like 20 stochastic variables here. And it, it's typically is the, is the case when the move is big, and this is what you always observe in the market, when the moves are big, they're well explained by, by a factor model, by like a, you know, like a low dimensional factor model. When the moves are small, like they could be all over the place. Like it's like it's just a noise that's like very difficult, difficult to capture with a few, maybe <coughs> just a few factors. So just uh, so moving on. Oops, where's my clicker? Oh, 
Oops. <laughs> it's getting recorded, right? <laughs> this is funny. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about uh, the pro rata. Pro rata allocation. Pro rata with stock. The, um, so it's people, like, especially students often ask me, like, why is it pro rata? Like, why is it not FIFO? And it's, uh, it's like reasons are mainly legacy. Like when it used to trade on the pit and there were just a few guys there, they wanted to encourage bigger orders. And, uh, and when, the, when the volatility of products is low, like you can get away with it. Like, you know, in the highly volatile product, you just can't really get away with it. And, you know, like the, these products are mostly FIFO. So this is the example just to get a sense of what it's like, the, uh, the pro rata was top. So the top order is the order that changes the price point. And uh, that order will, uh, will get filled fully. And then other orders like will just get allocated proportional to size. And that, so here is the example. In, in, in this case, like those are the offers. There was a top of 250, like there was an incoming buy for 300. So 250 immediately went into to that uh, top order. And then the remaining 50 gets uh, get allocated according to pro rata. But it's obviously all gets rounded. <coughs> and uh, it's actually not just the rounding, but you know, like the smallest order that can get allocated via pro rata is two contracts. So anything less than two like, will become FIFA. So this is so-called residual fees that will end up being FIFA. And that's, uh, this is one reason, like, we'll get to, be, to this topic a little bit later, but this is one reason when, uh, if you keep on placing really small orders and you don't really oversize your orders, it doesn't mean that you will never get filled ever. Like, it will just mean that you'll just keep on getting that residual piece. That, because like that's still FIFA. Go ahead. Derek, after the top order is filled, there's no more top orders? Or at all? In, in this example, when the in top this order gets filled, are right. any of the remaining residuals top orders or not anymore? Not anymore. Thank you. To put it the right way. So, so some of the implications of pro rata are fairly obvious, uh, right? Like the, uh, you have to oversize and there is so-called arms race to oversize. Like, you know, you have to oversize because everyone else is oversizing. And that leads to order books being very thick. And, the, uh, and it's actually the, uh, like the order cancellation rates are in high 90. So most of the orders that actually being placed, like they get canceled. And if you look at the ratios of like oh, of uh, you know, available size to trade to the actual trade size, it's about 200. Like it's a very very high ratio. The uh, you know on the I, I didn't mention that the tick size in this market is very big. Like the tick size is uh, half a basis point in most of the contracts. Like in uh, in outrights and spreads <coughs> and butterflies. What just happened? Huh? <laughs> I guess it doesn't affect the audio, so we'll be speaking in the dark. The, but in packs and bundles, it's, it's quarter basis point. That, but because tick size is so big and the, uh, you know, and the order books are so fake, like you actually, your actual bid offer is rarely bigger than the tick size. Like that's obviously not something that you see in the equities market when you actually realize bid offer is very often you know, much higher, much bigger than the tick size. But in this market, it like, rarely ever happens. So, so what are the implications of oversizing? Like the implications of oversizing is over trading, right? Like if you're oversizing, you can just get filled by accident, right? And then you end up with a position that's, which is much bigger than what you wanted. And then, uh, you know, like it's followed by panic unwinds. And then like everyone starts unwinding. Like it's, it's a very typical, unfortunately, like it's a, it's a fairly typical, you know, so-called smoke job in this market. <laughs> Go ahead. When you're talking about not getting filled, so let's say the top order in the last example was 250. <coughs> if I left my order out there for five contracts, how long would it hang out there before it would get filled and never get filled? Well, I, I can't really give you, like, there is no one answer, right? What I'm asking is, like, when you say not get filled, is it like minutes to not get filled? Is it just to never get filled? It could be hours. Okay. It's like, it, it definitely, it varies, and it also depends where, which part of the curve you're trading, right? It's much harder to get filled, like, in the first eight contracts. This is where like the books are like the thickest and the uh, I don't know is there such a word in English <laughs> the thickest books the and the e the impact of pro rata is the most significant like in, in the back of the curve is actually much less so and that and like the market makers and euro dollars uh, the uh, you know fairly big market makers because of pro rata like they barely have any market market share in the, for, in the in the first eight because many high frequency traders they they simply don't have the mandate to oversize. 
and that's uh, so as a result like they end up with giant market share like in like golds and, and purples and very tiny market share in, in in reds and greens and that's because like they just like their business is not set up in a way that's efficient to trade per hour because of because of oversizing but for sure like it's uh the like if you if you place an order of size five like you're probably going to get filled maybe not hours but maybe i don't know 15 minutes just because you keep on getting that residual piece like the five a piece that uh, it, it's a typical problem that execution broker will face that uh you know people often talk about that there are so few execution brokers in fixed income and there are so many of them in equities this is one reason like this is one of the major reasons that uh, because if you adjust an agency style execution broker like you can't really oversize well, you certainly cannot oversize your parent order. You can oversize your child orders up to the constraint of your parent order, but that's a very small impact. And that I've, I've played with like a few simulation environments that execution brokers provide, and typically what happens, like I get nothing until the end of the day, and then they just cross the spread. Like, thank you, I can do this myself, right? So th this is just an, an example of more of a visualization of what we talked about, like the, uh, <coughs> the, the thickness of the order book, and those are the, uh, like the first two levels of the order book. And this is the, on the right, uh, the, uh, so this is the smoke job that I, I started talking about, that the, it's, it's unfortunately a very painful scenario that occurs like all too frequently when everyone gets filled and then there is, everyone is selling and uh, then taking instant losses and and then like you know and then there is a recovery like maybe 15 20 minutes later like it recovers the so so what do we do like you know obviously like as a you know as a, like the first thing that comes to mind to any quant is like we want to try to come up with the optimal order size like how much you know do we want to post given the uh, you know given the microstructure in this market and it's, it's a good paper like that I recommend, the field and large paper on, um, on, on, on this topic. And what they're suggesting there like, is somewhat stylized. Like, every <laughs> single optimization that anyone ever writes about like, is always very stylized. It's not what you're going to end up doing in reality when you're trading. But it's a very good learning experience just like, to read it, to try it, to implement it. And the, uh, you know, this is like, one particular objective function that they're suggesting, but obviously like, you know, there could be many more. The, uh, the hardest part of the exercise is getting the right, getting your hands on the right data and building the data set. Because like, if you think about it, like, so what do, what do I need? This, by, the, by the way, there is a typo in the slide, like the F5 is, the, uh, is not the order size placed, is the order size executed. Like, we'll fix it before the slides are distributed. The, um, so, so what do we know? Like, you know? We know the state of the order book, like CME distributes that, uh, you know, that data, like we know what's in the order book. The, uh, we know what position we want, and uh, we can estimate like, fairly easily a distribution of the, of the market order sizes, like that, that's again like publicly available data. The, we can come up with our own risk tolerance, like you know, everyone can. The, what we don't quite know is like what are the orders out there, right? Like, because, because if you're a really big market maker, if your market share is huge, you know your own orders, but you don't know, you know, you don't know everybody else's orders. Like that's not publicly disseminated, but it could be constructed like from the evolution of the order books. You know, like we observe like all the changes in the order book, we can back out, you know, what what are the actual orders? Like we can we can we can figure this out, and the so it's not you know not impossible, and and one would have to any trader in this market would have to do this anyway, even for the purpose of developing a backtester. And we don't really talk about this, uh, the back test, like in this presentation, like we don't have that much time for it, but you know, you certainly like to, you know, to, to trade, you need a back tester. And, and if you need to be, uh, when, you, when you run your back test and you need to test uh, you know, your passive execution, you need, to have, you need to have some assumptions about the fills, right? You need to make some assumptions about, you know, what, is the, what are the probability of the fills given <coughs> the orders that I'm posting? So shifting gears, so, so we've talked about pro rata, uh, figuring out the optimal sizes and setting up this optimization problem. So another topic is hidden liquidity. So what is it? The, um, so if you think about this example, right, like if I want to buy U7, there are many different ways to do it. You know, the, uh, you know I can just buy U7. And by the way, like, so I've, I've talked about the outright contracts and the spreads and butterflies and packs and bundles. They all come with their own order books. That, 
And the obvious that there are obvious, you know, no arbitrage relationships between these contracts, given that they're all linear combinations of each other. But those no arbitrage relationships are really not enforced by anything other than just people trading, right? The, so there are moments where you can cross, and but you know they're rare. The uh, but you know those moments ex exist, and that those opportunities are more significant in periods of market stress, like when markets could just be completely dislocated. The, so going back to this, so I can you know I can buy U7, or I can buy Z7. I can buy the spread. I can buy U7 Z7 spread. Like that's another way to source liquidity in U7. I can also buy a butterfly and a spread and a Z7, and you, you can see like there's a bit of arithmetic that uh, you know it all cancels out, and I'm left with U7. And it, it list goes on, right? I can come up with combinations of you know many many lags that gives me back uh, U7. CME computes and disseminates uh, first. So this is called first generation implied liquidity. Like when I'm using existing visible liquidity to come up with uh, liquidity, that's that's called the first generation implied liquidity, and CME dis disseminates it. It's it does it a little bit slowly, like the, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's unlikely that you're gonna be able to rely on it at all times, and you probably would have to do it yourself. But this is all it does. But you can think of it like we can keep going, right? We can use first level of implied and, and visible to come up with a second generation implied and, and keep going, right? And that information is completely hidden, it's not disseminated by, by anyone. That like, one obvious example of hidden liquidity is the middle lag of the, uh, of the butterfly that uh, you know, like the uh, buying a butterfly in this example and, <coughs> and selling a spread, it implies liquidity for the two lots of the middle leg of the butterfly. And the this again, like it's not disseminated, and it's uh, it's probably like it's really the low hanging fruit because like to back this out, it really doesn't take anything. And the uh, the uh, I, and that's you know like that's it's somewhat surprising that it's not disseminated by CME, but that that's that, that's that's what it is. So you know it's obvious that sourcing this additional liquidity it lowers execution costs, like it helps us get out of positions. So like one thing that I didn't mention in the context of the private trading, right? Like the uh, the uh, so let's say you know like we've done the best job possible, we figure out like what are the optimal sizes to post and. And still, you know, obviously you can minimize the risk of getting, you know, overfilled, but you obviously cannot eliminate it, right? The, uh, so, you know, you will end up with positions that you don't want. And what happens, as I mentioned earlier, what typically happens is that there is a panic on wines and everyone is selling, and because like all of the high frequency trading systems out there, like they're just, they have limits on individual contract sizes, and they're just gonna start selling. Like they're all gonna be selling. And, so the optimal thing to do is to not do it, right? Like it's not a good idea to do anything that everyone else is doing like in, in a panicky mode. So you don't wanna do it. And so what do you wanna do instead? Like you wanna sell something else that's correlated, right? So let's say if you end up with this position A that's just much bigger than you want it, and you wanna sell B, and you don't wanna just sell some random B, you wanna do something that's you know A minus B, gives you a good mid frequency alpha, and that buys you time. And then you want to sit on that trade, like maybe for several hours until the end of the day, but you gradually work yourself out of that position. And that that's a much better strategy, in terms of you know PNL, in terms of risk management. And that's uh, but again, like it's uh, going back to that point that I made in the, in the very beginning of the talk that it requires the sort of m mindset that I can I can take risk, I can carry positions, I can offer liquidity, I can also have I can also have alpha and trade I'm the alpha trader and I'm the liquidity provider. And that's and not really be just like, you know, like I can never ever have anything bigger than, you know, fifty lots on my books. But so So how do we compute this hidden liquidity? It it fits uh, nicely into integer linear programming, into ILP framework. And that's and here is the example. You know, there is like this visible the best offer for the spread. Let's say it's uh, there is 1,100 contracts at five and a half cents. And can we improve on this offer price? <coughs> can we do better? How much size can we get? Or alternatively, can we find more size for that price point? That so that's the uh, so how we would formulate it. Like you know, we you know find x. <coughs> non-negative integer that minimizes cost, uh, cost function subject to constraints. So constraints like would describe the, the contracts themselves. So like, let's say if, if, my, uh, if I would only using outrights, then A would be just the uh, diagonal matrix. 
it will be just the identity matrix. And the cost function, again, like, you know, typically you would start with just the first order, just like with the best bid and best offer, but you can, you know, you don't have to, you can go deeper, you can go into the second, le third level of the order book, because un uh, otherwise sometimes you end up with this constraint that that particular leg that you want, like it only exists for a very small size, and it becomes a bottleneck for your whole, you know, for your whole optimization. So you can actually lower costs like going deeper into the order book. So that's the, uh, that's the ILP. So what are the practical issues? Uh, I don't know how many people in the room have done this before, that you know, like the integer programming, like it's, it's notoriously slow. Like it just takes a very long time to, to, to make sure that you have the optimal solution. And this sort of exercise makes, like it needs to really run online, right? Like it's not something you can just run overnight because like the order book changes, right? And that's, you really, it needs to re really needs to be an online application. And that, so the whole art of this is to really to get it to run quickly, right? To get it to run quickly, quickly enough, and also have a number of like a really customized uh, smaller problems because obviously it grows with the dimensionality. And like the one example of what would be a customized like a running on demand type exercise, if let's say you got overfilled like, in a, like you know, because of prorata fills, and then you need to work yourself out of that position, you would run it on demand of like actually trying to get this, like you know, I have this A minus B that I want to get out of. You would run it with like give me a best way of sourcing liquidity to of getting out of A minus B trade, right? So that's sort of like a smaller case, uh, you know, runs that like, could be very, very quick because like they don't, they don't really have, they're not thousand by thousand. They're smaller problems. The, the other ways of getting it faster is just you using simplex with some heuristics. And uh, you know, like there are just like there is a ton of like easily available literature. How do we make simplex to run really fast? How do we use previous solution? And uh, you know, how do we <coughs> reduce the number of inter iterations of simplex? So that's a very doable problem. The uh, it's also very very you know it's very useful uh, for for execution. That's that's why like the, the very few execution brokers that we have that operate in fixed income like like quantitative brokers for instance they heavily rely on this uh, to execute for clients because like for them, like the execution window is typically a day, like they get like daily orders, like and they need to execute and they rely on this very heavily to source liquidity that uh, you may not be able to, you know, get thousand contracts like, you know, instantly. You don't have a lot of additional liquidity available instantly, but gradually over time, like over the course of the day, you will get enough, like, you know, to fill, to fill like a reasonable size order. And then from what, what I've seen in my personal experience, uh, like the profitability of this work is enormous in periods of market stress. Because as I said earlier, like when markets get really dislocated, you end up with, you really end up with opportunities to cross. Like you see that you can just cross. And, that, and that's, uh, because like the, the order books are just really become really inconsistent. And in that, because you would have something, uh, because options on Euro dollars, they actually still trade on the pit, like they're not electronic. And that's probably about like 15, 20 percent electronic options, and most of it is done by the pit. And and that's so you would have maybe somebody like you know specifically really hitting, you know like just the outright books and not really and, and the like the, the packing bundles like would not really change. I mean they will change in a span of minutes. They will not change in seconds. And that certainly like you know I'm not going to claim that there are opportunities to cross it are there for hours. Obviously not, right? So let's talk, how much time do we have? We have 10 minutes? Oh, wow. So few. Okay. So let's talk about uh, just dynamical properties a little bit. So as, as I mentioned, the tick size is very big. Like it's a half a basis point. And price volatility is fairly low. Like it's, you know, maybe something like, again, you know, half a basis point. And that, so you find that like most of the alpha that you find is, uh, is not that big, and you can't really afford to cross the spread most of the time. So you have to be passive. So like most of the alpha strategies in this market, you know, they're really passive. Like they need that roughly targeting something like 70, 80% passive execution. And so the alpha traders, like they really need to be market makers. They need to be offering liquidity. And the uh, and that's like that's another reason why like you have these blurry lines between liquidity provision and alpha trading and, and execution, right? Because if I'm an alpha trader, but I actually need to know how to get done passively, I need to think about liquidity provision all the time, right? 
and that I need to bake this into my backtesting as well, like the, uh, the, uh, the fact that my orders, of course, <coughs> typically when you backtest a strategy, the, uh, you know, you're gonna make a conservative assumption, you're gonna assume that you're gonna cross the spread, <coughs> right? And if you find that your strategy is successful in the backtest, even though you make the assumption that you're gonna be crossing the spread, then that's great. Like that means that in actual trading, you can do better than that by not crossing the spread, by actually being passive and not paying the bid offer. But generally speaking, like most of the strategies will just not be successful if you're always aggressive. The, the, and then the market makers, as we said earlier, right, market makers need to think about risk all the time because of prorata, right? And because, uh, you know, that's one of the, prorata is one of the reasons. The other reason is, like I haven't mentioned it yet, is that the activity is fairly bursty, that uh, sometimes they could be 10 minutes will go by that nothing happens in this market. And then there are this bursts of activity. Like it's a very, you know, the price point is like a fairly sticky activity is bursty and very difficult to turn around uh, your position. Like, you know, even if you, you know, a, a market maker. The, you know, the other thing is the yield curve effect. Like this is, uh, you know, it really should have mentioned it earlier. Like it's, uh, the yield curve effect is very significant. The correlations between the contracts is very high. And that's, and it's easy to understand why, right? Like those LIBOR contracts, like, you know, like those LIBOR rates, like they are, only to say three months, six months apart, like those are, you know, very similar rates. Like the futures rates are very similar; they're highly correlated, and uh, you know, and the correlations are high. Like they're also very difficult to break. That's like a, a typical story that you see like everywhere, right? Like in equities, you know, correlations are fairly low, and the error bounds are wide, and the correlations can break. And that's why typically, like the in equities, like you know, when someone, like when a client wants like a, a huge position in Apple you're not gonna you know, hedge it with Microsoft. Like it's, it's just like a really, really bad hedge. And the, the, but when the fixed income correlations are generally much higher, much more difficult to break the, in you know, the 90s. And, the, uh, and you know, there are, there are trade-offs. Uh, you know, there are pluses and minuses. The, the, uh, so here is, here, is a here is the snapshot of activity and I can, uh, the only thing that's uh, interesting here is uh, if you look at the last trade times, if you look at the, at the uh, last time that like, these countries have traded, and you see that the U, U8 in this example, like it, it traded at you know, 9.08, and these, the eights like, haven't traded since like 9.02, even though like, these contracts are only three months apart. And, that, and this is also, like, it's not even the most extreme example. Like, this is just like, something that I've picked up uh, you know, quickly. And the, so you, you have this, you, you have this, uh, you know, you have this market like where, you know, like in, in a particular time window, let's say like in a time window of, you know, five, 10 minutes, the, the number of instruments that trade is a much smaller number than the instrument that you need to be making markets on. So if, let's say, if I'm a market maker and I need to be making markets in this whole, you know, universe, and uh, the tradable, the, the contracts that have traded, like in the same in the past 10 minutes, like it's a, you know, just much, it's, it's a smaller number. And so that sort of setup, like it fits into a Kalman filter, you know, framework, like really well. And that's, uh, that has, has been done in fixed income for, you know, for many years, like, you know, like back in the day, like we, even when like Euro governments became electronic, like that was like a fairly standard setup, like when, uh, there are very few trades, but you need to make markets and things that haven't traded. Like you don't really have history in that particular contract, but you have history in uh, what few points have done, like few points on the yield curve have done. So it's, it's the same story in Euro dollars. So what's important for market making? And uh, of course the micro price is gonna be important. And like that's going to be a starting point, like is uh, something that's order book based. The uh, but we also need a mid frequency forecast, right? And why do we need mid frequency forecast? Is because if I've said that you know contracts haven't traded for for a while, we might be holding inventory, and we need to account for the correlation. Gosh, we have very few minutes, and I have so many slides. <laughs> Well, we talked about <coughs> Kalman, right? And uh, so it's like, it's, it's fairly intuitive. How would we set this up? The, uh, you know, so the measurement equation would link state variables to observable data. And again, like, you know, we'll have to think about like, what exactly is that observable data? Do we use trade prices? Do we use some sort of process prices, like mid prices? 
do we do it separately for bids and offers and that's the uh, the state transition can come you know either from something simple like a co-integration type model or from a temperature model it's a little bit more complicated the you know so we we have a you know state transition equation we update the uh, we update the state from a few things that we we have observed recently then we can generate the forecast for the states and then we translate it into the forecast for the points like the, that we need you know we need we need to have forecast for you know either via factor loading so via like a pricing equation of a term structure model and and there are trade-offs like term structure model certainly is, is more complicated like than like a simple factor model but the main advantage of a term structure model is that you can actually generate forecasts for things that you have not used in your estimation like the one example in fixed income like for instance the swap futures are, you know are growing like it's a new market like it's it's also like you know those are like you know, packets of, you can think of it as like packets of Euro dollar futures, like very similar to bundles. And you don't really have any reliable data for swap futures to use in your estimation. So you can't really use co-integration for it, but you can use the term structure model for it. Like that you'll be, you'll have a purely Euro dollar driven term structure model that's capable of generating forecasts for swap futures via the pricing equation. So that's the, the, the trade-off. Like, so you have a bit of extra complexity in terms of the estimation, but you have a lot more pricing power you know, for the points that actually don't really have reliable data. So what else is, uh, so there are a few examples here of a model. We don't have time, right? So maybe I should just like give people a chance to ask questions. How much capital do you need to be involved in this market? How much capital? Well, in terms of like just the pure CME requirements, like they're fairly modest. That, uh, you know, just to, in terms of the, just the margin requirements, like they're fairly small. So depending on like what your targets are, how much p you want to make, that uh, it's, you know, it's, it's like, I, I know personally of day traders who are just like sitting at home with a TT and they trade Euro dollars, right? With like, you know, and then generating you know, with like very modest capital and like, you know, generating, let's say, something like, like a couple of million dollars a year. Like that's, that's very doable. And, and that, that's why like the market is a lot more accessible now than it used to be. Like, and that's, uh, you know, like something like TT, like it made it accessible to, you know, to people who are not, you know, Goldman Sachs. But, but you know, if you're working for like, you know, for, for let's say like, a, you know, like Millennium or Citadel, et cetera, they're gonna have significantly higher requirements for, you know, like a risk-based risk -based capital that you need to have. And they also have much, they're gonna have much higher, you know, profit requirements, right? Of how much, you know, for, like they would wanna, they would wanna generate something like $20 million and, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, with uh, something like, uh, like a daily ball of, uh, of, of like a million. Yeah? Sorry, I think, I think maybe you skipped over it, but to what extent can one uh, trade these things without having to have volatility model I don't think you have to necessarily have a stochastic volatility model the it's you're trading underlying not the options right and like the affine like the general affine model that I mentioned in the slides here like it's uh, it, it allows for like a stochastic volatility you know specification but you don't really have to have it like you can certainly get away with uh, you know People would argue that you can even trade like with like even a Gaussian model, right? Because like you are like the, the way you're setting up your Kalman, like your horizons are so short, your sensitivities to to actual like you know like the rate and vol dynamics are they're not massive, right? Like when you're trading options, it's different. <coughs> that uh, but in the context of a general affine model, which is like I'm sorry we didn't get a chance to talk about it, the but you can look it up. It's it's uh, the reason I personally like it is because well I'm not the only one. Lots of people like it. Is it's a nice sweet spot between complexity and power, right? Because like typically practitioners in this market, like they face this sort of dilemma all the time. Like, do I go for something that's very, very simple, but very stupid, right? Or do I go for something that's extremely complicated, but like super duper powerful, right? And that's, a, and that you're always constantly looking for things that are in this sweet spot. And that, and the general affine model, like it has that, like it has very sensible dynamics. You can have skew, you can have stochastic skew, you can have deterministic skew. And you can actually, like, you don't need any PDEs to uh, come up with uh, analytics for euro dollar futures or even options, right? Like, it's up to ODEs, which are, like, you know, as, as quick as closed form expressions. So, uh, Kelman uh, requires a Gaussian distribution, correct? Uh, 
um, are you, do you find that your price distributions are actually Gaussian? Well, like in the general FI model, like if you, you would not use a Gaussian, you would like you would use moments over like you know non-central high square, and then you would use a Gaussian with the moments coming over non-central high square. That's so that's a, that's the trick. Okay. Uh, have you ever found yourself in a situation where you want to go and hedge on a highly correlated uh, asset, <coughs> but the correlation temporarily breaks, and then you just end up doubling your risk up? Well, it, well, of course. I mean, like, I'm not going to tell you that, that that has never happened, right? Of course it can happen. And it's, uh, but, but you think of it as, as you think of any trading, right? Like whenever you trade anything, you make an assumption and you account for the situations when that assumption breaks down, right? Like that's, what do you do? That's uh, when something is moving against you, at which point do you tell yourself that I don't really believe my model anymore, right? Like that's, that's it's one of the more complicated like think about in, in investing, right? Because like there'll be part of, like, there'll be some people who would argue that like when it's moving against me, like my model is only getting stronger because like it's telling me to double up and my alpha is getting bigger, right? And there'll be other people who will be very humble and they'll say like when something happens that I don't understand, <coughs> I'm just gonna exit, right? I personally believe that my personal view is that your signal should be getting weaker. When something is moving against you, I think you have to have this baked in property that your signal is getting weaker, that your level of conviction is declining, not growing. And that's, and yeah, like eventually it will just take you out of the trade, right? That your correlation, correlation doesn't ever break down instantly, right? Like it breaks down over some period of time. And as it's moving against you, your signal should be getting weaker. And at some point it's just gonna tell you to just like, you know, to take the loss and exit. But it, it, it certainly happens and that's, uh, but in, in fixed income it just doesn't happen as often. And it also depends where, right? You know, like the, the correlations in the front of the yield curve, like they're, they're also weaker and uh, you know they, they break more frequently, right? Because like again, like the if you think of like contracts, like you know in the say in the next six months, is Fed gonna are they gonna raise rates in six months or in nine <coughs> months or in in twelve months, right? Like there is those this data changes all the time, right? There's a lot of uncertainty there, and those correlations can change very rapidly, like you know, on as as a response to news. But when you go like three years out, the correlation between three year and the four year. Like, what would be the reason for that correlation to break down really massively? Like, I, I cannot really think of one. But um, I guess it, the liquidity is the goal. It doesn't seem like there's a market that's necessarily achieving that goal. Like, kick sizes are large, and calculation, as you mentioned, has a very steep Even though the, the order book size is large. <coughs> I'm kind of wondering whether you think there You're saying like, why is it pro rata? Well, let's say you could start from scratch to redesign the euro dollar market. Is this the system that you would have? Well, it, these debates happen all the time. And the argument is always that like, it makes it more, in, in some sense, it makes it more accessible. Because like, it makes it more accessible to certain types of investors who would say like they're not as fast, right? Because like, to trade in this market, it's really not about speed. This is another interesting point that like, I'm sorry we don't have time to talk about it, is that like in most of the high frequency trading shops, like they're most, mostly equities people and they come from equities into fixed income and they always extremely focused on speed. And because in equities, like it's really all about the speed and, and, and also like about the, the ability to access many different exchanges like with the same piece of code. And, and it's just not relevant for the CME market at all because like it's just one exchange and, it's, uh, and the speed doesn't matter you know, as, as I mentioned, like there are people <coughs> sitting at home with CT making, you know, millions of dollars and that's, and that, but it's, it's just a different type of accessibility, right? Like it's, it's more capital, like it's more risk intensive. It's not speed intensive, right? <coughs> so the <coughs> argument is that, uh, that, the, that the CME is making, well, probably not CME itself, but like the existing market makers that already built in to that particular microstructure, like any change is expensive, right? And the argument is like when volatility is low, you make it more accessible this way to investors who don't have the capabilities to be fast. But I think we're going to have to cut it off here because this is very interesting questioning. Um, and we are all in Wharton for the afternoon keynote about untapped alpha. Thank you so much, Ian. Sure. Thank you.